Hello everyone and welcome back to Cine 104 and this is class 5. Remember if you are in the Saturday class this would be the morning of the third class I believe. All right so let's get rolling. First off I have to say that Make a, make a uh, break in your notes because this is where we'd have a test. So everything up to this point would be a test and now we're on a new section of the class. So uh, make a line. When we get to taking tests, uh, up, up to this point would be a test. And then after this would be where another test would be. Okay, anyway. Moving through the 1950s and into the 1960s, we come up with the live TV generation. And these are mostly young men, a few women, but mostly young men. And they started in live TV in the 1950s. They're not as famous as the film school generation, but they made big contributions to motion pictures in the 1960s. And they were... Uh, not making big, bloated sorts of Hollywood movies. They're making very lean and very interesting and much smaller sorts of movies, but they were making them on television, and they were doing it live. And chief among them, John Frankenheimer, made many, many live TV shows, and he went on to make feature films. So did Arthur Penn with Bonnie and Clyde, Norman Jewison, Sidney Pollack, and Sidney Lumet. So all these very young men, they would have been in their 20s when they were doing this in the 1950s, uh, transitioned to uh, uh, California, the West Coast, and they started making some very interesting films and brought a new sensibility to their movie making. Uh, a little bit like what we're going to be coming up with in just a little bit, which is the French New Wave. So they were shooting very lean movies, not big budget stuff, uh, and they're shooting movies for television, really, 90-minute television shows with uh, very interesting uh, themes. Sort of adult themes for television, really, when you get down to it. And that is to be contrasted with the kinds of movies that were being made in Hollywood trying to slow the advancement or to compete with television. And the author of our textbook calls this the bloated era. Attendance is still dropping through the 1950s since the, the rise of television, the chipping away, chipping away at uh, theater attendance. And this is, this is uh, going to be emphasized uh, and represented by Cleopatra. And when we adjust for inflation, this movie would have cost somewhere around $300 million in today's dollars. Uh, there are a few movies today that get up this high, that's for sure. But back then it was pretty rare for uh, big movies uh, for 150 200 250 million dollars. Again, once we adjust for inflation. This is the movie starring uh, Elizabeth Taylor, right there on the right, and Richard Burton. And... Elizabeth Taylor had the very first $1 million contract. She was a pretty big star. I think she'd already won an Oscar by this point. And she and Richard Burton were going to shoot this movie together. They started off in, in uh, England. And the weather in England is not very close to the weather in Italy or in Egypt. So they ended up packing up. The producers and directors ended up packing up and moving the whole show to Italy. And they had a rather notorious off-screen, on-screen and off-screen love affair. They were both married to other people at the time. And in the evenings after and weekends after the shooting of the uh, film had taken place, they would be off in nightclubs and in restaurants and the back corner booth and making out and all that. And they had to have known 
that they were being watched. It appeared practically uh, the next day in the press. And uh, some people say any publicity is good publicity. Maybe so, maybe so. Still, uh, America and the world were was a lot more conservative back then, and the whole idea of committing adultery is what they were doing. Committing adultery in plain view was... Uh, possibly going to cause some trouble, maybe some boycotts, things like that. Uh, if you want to sneak around, uh, you know, in your hotel, you pay off maybe the, the maid or somebody or the bellboy, and you sneak into somebody else's room uh, at the uh, at the hotel. Uh, so the whole idea of them going to nightclubs and so on, uh, plainly, they knew what they were doing. But this film lost tons of money uh, in, its, uh, in the outset. It took a long time for it to make its money back. And since most movies use money that is borrowed from a bank, you want to pay back the loan as fast as you can to avoid too much interest. And the fact that this movie took maybe eight or ten years to pay back all the money uh, means that in, in the end it really ended up losing quite a bit. And the studio, 20th Century Fox, ended up having to sell off some of its uh, uh, lot and so on, like other studios of the era. Uh, they were all having hard times, and a number of them started selling off some of their props. And uh, MGM, with uh, selling off uh, Judy Garland or Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz's uh, ruby slippers and things like that, 20th Century Fox... This studio here from uh, Cleopatra sold uh, off hundreds of acres of its back lot, and that ended up becoming Century City, which is up on the west side of L.A., south of Beverly Hills. Pretty expensive land right there, uh, but that became Century City. So if you're up there, there's, a, there's a, a big office buildings and, uh, and, a, and a mall, and a lot of nice housing, and that was 20th Century Fox. And there were too many movies like that. That wasn't the only one. There were, there were really dozens of big, bloated movies. The studios thought that was the best way to compete with television. Television was small, so to speak, on maybe 21-inch television. Diagonal TVs, they, the TVs weren't very big. 21 or 27-inch TVs would have been a pretty big TV back then. We have computer monitors that are that big today. Um, and so uh, a, a television, uh, mostly in black and white, and, and, uh, and uh, smaller, at really, much smaller than movies, especially so back then. And so the movie studios thought, we will put... Big movies, widescreen movies, long movies, three, four hour long movies, color, uh, movies long enough that they would need an intermission, and so on. Uh, roadshow movies, we've talked about roadshows, roadshow movies, and they would make fewer of them. Since they cost more money, they would make fewer of them. And this isn't really a very good uh, business decision, as it turns out. Movies have always been uh, really entertainment for the masses. They cost uh, much less than going to the theater, going to a concert, uh, even going out to dinner, aside from something in a fast food place. Um, movies are, are cheap entertainment. They go all the way back to Nickelodeons and so on. And the idea of more expensive tickets for these roadshow movies and, and really long and, and, uh, and intermissions, the idea was that Movies would be special. You might even get dressed up to go out to the movies, just like you would get dressed up to go out to the theater. And uh, really, not the not the wisest move. Um, TV or movies and TV, but movies really are a mass medium, really for the masses. And so these big uh, these big color roadshow movies was uh, uh, not working very well at all. So contrasting. That was what they were uh, movies that were happening overseas. And in Italy, they had neorealist films. 
new realism, neorealist films, small movies, mostly black and white, low budget, all that. English uh, had a, a uh, few movies uh, with, that were dubbed kitchen sink cinema um, in that they would just be scenes in houses, normal houses, not palaces or um, pyramids and things like that, that with, uh, with uh, um, chariot races and big, big stuff like that. It would just be uh, in a normal English house, and you could see the kitchen sink. So somebody dubbed them kitchen sink cinema. But the one that was the most famous is the French New Wave. Was the French New Wave. Uh, Nouvelle Vague, sometimes if you're reading it uh, in, uh, in a, uh, online or something, the New Wave. And the very first one was Breathless, made in 1959 and finally came to the States in 1960 and directed by Jean-Luc Godard and uh, co-written with Francois Truffaut. And both of these gentlemen were film critics and they loved American movies. They loved American movies. They loved film noir. They loved uh, uh, the Humphrey Bogart movies and all that. And they really thought American movies had lost their way with the big bloated cinema that was emanating from Hollywood. And eventually, most critics are going to get told, if you're so smart, why don't you make a movie? Why don't you show them how to do it? If you're so smart, right? Everybody loves to rag on critics. Uh, and uh, so they said, okay, we will, right? They sort of took them up. They took up the, their critics uh, and said, we will, right? We're going to go out, we're going to make movies, and we're going to be all stripped down, and we're not going to make big, bloated movies like Hollywood is doing. So they broke a lot of the rules of classic Hollywood cinema. That's a, a big part of it. And of course, this became very popular on college campuses and uh, things like that. These wonderful, quirky, little, small French New Wave movies and um, sort of a slice of life movies. They didn't uh, uh, they didn't have dolly tracks, okay? They would just carry it around by hand, handheld. That's something that Hollywood very rarely did was handheld shooting. Sometimes if they wanted a smoother shot, they could push somebody around in a wheelchair or some kind of a cart or something like that. They didn't get shooting permits. They uh, would hide the camera and put the camera in a uh, canvas bag. I understand. Uh, I understand uh, at one point they got like a mail bag and cut a hole in it for the lens and shot through that. So the camera operator would have been uh, holding the camera about waist high. You can kind of tell from this shot right here, the camera's about waist high and backing up. Maybe one other person was right there uh, with them. They would dub the dialogue in later. So there's no reflectors, there's no dolly tracks, there's nothing like that. And they're just going to shoot right on the streets, right on the streets of Paris, uh, at the, uh, the main shopping thoroughfare, the Champs-Élysées, places like that. Of course, they didn't have lights, none of that. They didn't have any of that. And uh, they uh, would not even do traditional editing. Uh, if they thought a scene was running a little bit long, they would just chop it up. Normally, if you're shooting a scene with two people like this, uh, even student filmmakers, you'd shoot the whole scene over at least three times. You'd shoot the whole scene on the two of them in, in a, a sort of a cover shot, and then you'd shoot the whole scene on him, and he would say his lines and react to her and so on, and then you'd go back to the beginning, reset, and shoot the whole thing on her and her uh, dialogue and uh, reactions and so on on, on medium shots and close-ups. Probably a lot more than three times, but three times would be kind of a bare minimum, right, for what they call in the business coverage. Right? You want to cover uh, various angles and all that. In Hollywood, they might take all day or even more than a day to shoot a three or four minute scene of two people walking down the street. But uh, the French filmmakers, they don't have all day. They don't have shooting permits. They're just going to shoot the whole thing in one shot, in one take and uh, just on a, on a, on a two-shot, on the two of them. And if they need high angles or anything like that, they don't have cranes or jibs or anything like that, they're going to find 
a window up there, an office window or somebody's apartment or something like that, and go up there, and that's where they're going to get their high angle shots. And the scene uh, that you're going to watch, uh, uh, amazingly, the entire movie is for free on YouTube. And I don't expect you to watch the whole movie, so I've, I've uh, marked out uh, two or three sections that I normally would show in class. Uh, mostly them walking around, and uh, I like to point out, with my laser pointer, I like to point out uh, the people that sort of are looking a little bit at them. But it's a big city, Paris, uh, just like, um, just like uh, New York, maybe, or, or, or L.A., and big city people, they've got places to go and everything. They're not exactly uh, going to stop and watch for a long time, but it is fun to watch people walking along the streets and uh, sort of looking at them a little bit, and in one, uh, in one scene, a uh, young service, uh, a young service man from I don't know, maybe he's in the navy or, or army or something. He's in uniform, and he's gonna bum a light uh, from the, this guy here, Jean Paul Belmondo, and Belmondo's gonna stay right in character. He's gonna he's gonna say, I don't have a light. Go go find your own light. Um, and the, the girl is Jean Seberg. And she has quite an interesting life story herself, um, and uh, you can you can check her out uh, as well. Um, but she's a little um, a little untraditional here. She's wearing slacks. Yeah, some women some women women in the nineteen uh, late nineteen fifties and early nineteen sixties maybe were wearing slacks and so on. But you know most most young ladies would be wearing dresses and probably have longer hair, uh, and not this very, very short, sort of a French cut like that. Uh, if you think like Marilyn Monroe or something like that, that's the way uh, American movie stars were back in uh, the early 1960s, not in this sort of boyish look with the, with the slacks and the, and the very short cropped hair and all that. And so Jean Seberg is American, uh, so um, when she speaks, she'll be speaking French with uh, an American accent. Maybe you can tell, maybe not. And the clip, or the film, actually the entire film, but the parts of the film that I've marked out for you to watch, uh, there are no subtitles, and that's good. Normally I turn the subtitles off when I show clips from this film. I don't want you uh, reading the subtitles and losing track. I want you to watch the visuals, watch that it looks like somebody's holding the camera about waist high and backing up and that it's handheld and people sort of walking by on the street, some of them turning around a little bit to look and then, and then walking on. So uh, don't worry about no subtitles in the clip you're going to watch. Uh, I turn them off anyway. So what did they use? They didn't use, uh, they didn't use dolly tracks and shooting permits and cranes and lights and all that. But they did have a script. So uh, they weren't just making up the whole thing. The whole thing wasn't uh, improvisation or anything like that. They did have a script of sorts, um, but uh, everything else was breaking the rules, right? The French New Wave. And it wasn't around for a long, long time, well, maybe three or four years. Um, but, uh, you know, by the 1990s, people were doing various things like that, shooting uh, movies with video uh, and not having any music, so any music uh, that you'd hear in the movie would have to be coming from a radio that would be seen in the movie, or perhaps if there's a, if there's a, uh, a band or something like that. But uh, all of the music in some of these movies that were made in Denmark and other places like that in the 1990s uh, really takes off from this. And this, um, this look, this sort of handheld herky-jerky look, they are doing it because they don't have a shooting permit and they can't lay down dolly tracks and all that sort of thing. And they are sort of taking on the look of documentary filmmaking. And, it, you know, in a lot of documentary uh, films, there's no time to stop, set up uh, tripods and things like that. And, uh, at, you know, and in a war zone, especially, you're running and shooting and the camera's all bouncing around and herky-jerky and everything. And... Even so, a lot of uh, documentaries, you really want to capture truth 
that's the whole idea. Capture truth as it is. You don't want to have too much uh, artifice with with reflectors and dolly tracks and all that. So if this were a documentary, uh, it would probably look very similar to the way it looks now. And then, so they're sort of borrowing from that documentary look. After uh, this film, uh, the Beatles film, A Hard Day's Night, kind of has a lot of this style. And we've already talked about A Hard Day's Night. Maybe you've looked at some clips from it but they uh, are handheld and it's black and white and it really seems kind of off the cuff like that too, kind of a documentary look. But if we flash forward 30 years, then we get a lot of these sort of fake documentaries, confessional type documentaries, where people turn to the camera and talk directly to the camera about uh, you know, what they're thinking, borrowing uh, um, techniques from documentaries and from this film. So shows like The Office or um, uh, Big Brother and some of those uh, some of those kinds of shows, uh, they're doing that whole herky jerky uh, camera movement and zooming and all that kind of stuff. But they don't really need to. Uh, movies have done that. Some of the Born Identity movies have done that. It really was a thing for maybe ten years or so. Thankfully, it's kind of fading away. But they're really trying to make movies look fresh and now and urgent and we don't have time to set up uh, tripods and all that kind of stuff but a lot of a lot of those movies are very big budget movies and the same thing for television shows NYPD Blue and some other shows uh, Modern Family uh, go for that look in the office they go for that look but those are union shoots uh, and they all get to take breaks and everything and they're just sort of bouncing the camera around to make it look like it's a documentary it really isn't and um, Nah, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of that sort of fake, herky-jerky look. I, I'm fine with it if it's needed, if you don't have a shooting permit or whatever, I'm fine with it, but uh, sort of doing it on purpose, um, it's not really my thing. But anyway, uh, everybody gets to make their own choice. Okay, we are now going to transition to Stanley Kubrick, the rest of the cl class, actually. Um, oh, and before I forget, uh, there is a nice trailer for Cleopatra. Let me let me just go back to Cleopatra here uh, real quickly. There's a nice there's a nice trailer uh, for Cleopatra as a roadshow movie, and they're going to talk about reserve your seat now and that sort of thing. So uh, that is kind of fun. Um, I've never seen one before like that, uh, about reserving your seats for a roadshow movie. So, I almost forgot. Okay, back to Stanley Kubrick. American director, definitely an auteur. We're going to probably watch more Stanley Kubrick movies in this class than any other uh, director. Because he works in so many different, uh, uh, so many different genres and styles and so on. And he's a favorite of mine, but he's well regarded in the film community. He's really legendary, a real, a real genius. So we're going to spend the rest of the class looking at three Stanley Kubrick films. And when I teach this class in the classroom, in person, we would spend a lot of time looking at lots of scenes of these three films, Dr. Strangelove and 2001 and A Clockwork Orange. So uh, there are quite a few uh, clips that I've got marked out for you with the URLs and all that. Works out just fine. I've been testing out uh, the, the emails and the URLs and all that. And at least on my phone, everything comes out quite nicely. So uh, spend some time. And like I say, I, I would be in class. I would be spending a lot of time on these three films, uh, watching bits and pieces of, of them from uh, beginning to end. So, uh, and if you can find the film, by the way, if you if you're into if you're into it, if you've got a copy of the film, if you can find it, I'm not uh, telling you to spend money on these films to spend uh, uh, three dollars or or whatever renting the movie or downloading it or whatever. But if you've got it around, or if it looks kind of interesting to you, uh, that's really the way to go. They're really all worth watching. 
from start to finish. So I'm sorry I have to do it with with uh, clips. When I bring the DVDs into class, I can uh, do it a little bit better. It's it's not bad. I've I've spent a lot of time tracking down these clips and and putting them in the right order so they're in the order uh, chronological order that you'd see in the movie. So uh, be sure to be sure to watch those clips. I would um, listen to the discussion on Doctor Strange Love and then and then uh, pause that part of it. Stay there. Stay right there on YouTube and then uh, go watch the, the uh, seven or so clips from Dr. Strange Love and then continue on that way. That's the way I'd be doing it in class, and if you can replicate that, then uh, that's really the best way, I think, to go through the movies. Okay, a wonderful scene from 2001, wonderful sets, and uh, he's, he spent four years making the movie, he worked in many genres. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to name them off or to match them or anything like that. Uh, just the fact that he worked in many genres is really the key. And these are most of his films. I might be missing a couple uh, in here. Uh, I see I don't have Barry Lyndon on there, and that's a good movie. It's a little, it's not exactly my taste, but it's uh, photographically it's a gorgeous movie. Um, and some early stuff, but basically that's about it for Kubrick. Um, and so some film noir, uh, a couple of war movies, Full Metal Jacket and Paths of Glory, a big historical epic, Spartacus, uh, Lolita, a very odd comedy, drama, romance uh, sort of a film about a, a uh, adult man and a 12-year-old girl, and he falls in love with her. And they, man they amazingly managed to make it and get it in theaters and everything and pass the censors. It's based on a rather famous book, uh, but he was, he was obsessed uh, with, uh, with her. He got the author of the book, Vladimir Nabokov, to uh, write the screenplay. And he wisely made it much more of a comedy. And Peter Sellers, who is going to do extensive work in Dr. Strangelove uh, played uh, a couple of parts in the movie and uh, really sort of changes the tone of it. But anyway, it's a very, very challenging movie, very odd movie. Um, it wouldn't even be rated R, but uh, it's, uh, you can tell what's, uh, what's going on. Dr. Strangelove is a black comedy, and a black comedy is comedy, doesn't have anything to do with race, has to do with uh, dark subject matter, whether it is perhaps the funeral industry or nuclear war, as this one is, or perhaps the coronavirus, okay? Maybe somebody would make a comedy about the coronavirus, okay? That would be a black comedy. And then moving on, 2001, sci-fi, very scientific, not much fantasy or anything like that that you might find in, in Star Wars. Uh, it's more what they call hard science. Uh, Clockwork Orange, dystopian future. We're going to spend a chunk of time on Clockwork Orange. The Shining, we've already looked at when we talked about the stages of the genre film. And it's a revisionist horror film. And Full Metal Jacket, when we start talking about Vietnam War movies, we will come up and uh, look at a couple of scenes from Full Metal Jacket as well. And then his last film, Eyes Wide Shut with Tom Cruise and his then wife, Nicole Kidman. All right, let's dive in to Dr. Strangelove. 1964, the same year that The Beatles' Hard Day's Night came out, by the way, and it is a black comedy. Peter Sellers played three parts, President Merkin Muffley, Dr. Strangelove, and Colonel Mandrake. Colonel Mandrake. And they were having a lot of fun with the names of the characters in, in this movie. Let's see here. What, what's on the next slide? Yeah, double entendre. Okay, nice French word. A lot of the, a lot of the names have double meaning. Okay, turgid is to be firm and erect. Okay, so they're having fun with that. Jack the Ripper, easy. Bat guano, 
His nickname is Bat. I don't know if it's Bartholomew or something, but Bat. And guano is the scientific term for bird shit, basically. Okay, bird shit. So this guy is bat shit crazy. Yes, okay, so bat guano, Major Kong, Major King Kong. We get Premier Kiss Off, okay, that's fun. And Dasadsky, um, taking off from the Marquis de Sade, who wrote uh, a few hundred years ago about, uh, about the pleasure of uh, giving and receiving pain, spanking, that sort of thing, bondage. Uh, so that's the Marquis de Sade. So we have, uh, I think he's Ambassador de Sadsky, something like that. We have the Laputa Air Base. And if you are a Spanish speaker, you know that Puta would be prostitute. There's Peter Sellers as Dr. Strange Love. Let's go back. And President Merkin Muffley, very obscure, very, very obscure. A Merkin is a pubic wig. Yes, there is such a thing. It is a pubic wig. And uh, I don't know where that came from. I don't know if it, what kind of a word it is, English or French or something, but that's what it is. And that is our president, the president's name, Merkin Muffley. Dr. Strange Love, okay. Uh, and then Colonel Mandrake, and Mandrake is a poisonous root. And uh, here we are in the War Room, a, an amazing set uh, designed by the same guy that designed a lot of the James Bond sets in the early going, Goldfinger and some of that. His name is Ken Adam, and uh, really a fantastic set. When one of our more recent presidents um, became president, he wanted to see the war room. And somebody had to tell him, well, that was just a movie set. <laughs> uh, there really isn't a war room, Mr. President, but in the movie it's, I don't know, beneath, I guess, way underground uh, at the Pentagon, something like that. Uh, but uh, it really is an amazing set. And they sort of have like a computer simulated uh, screens uh, right here, and they had to do, they had to take 16 millimeter cameras, go behind there and sort of do a rear projection thing. So these seem to be almost like computer projections, but they're, they're film cameras that are projecting from behind that had to be uh, made and animated and all that. And uh, Kubrick uh, did that on uh, the, uh, the airplane, and then he did a lot of that sort of thing in 2001. There are lots of computer screens in 2001. Computer screens couldn't do what they wanted them to do in 2001, so they filmed um, uh, from textbooks and animations and things like that, and then projected them from behind the set, little you know, bunches of film projectors uh, strapped to the set, and the whole set would be revolving in some cases, uh, and the film projectors had to be able to project upside down, and round and round they would go, uh, to make it look like the the video monitors, the computer screens, were, were actually doing computing. Uh, but they didn't have that technology back then, so they had to use film projectors. Okay, and there's Peter Sellers as Dr. Strangelove, and he is kind of based on some uh, German uh, uh, physicists and doctors and so on. We got uh, a number of them from Nazi Germany. And Dr. Strangelove here, uh, once he appears on screen toward the uh, later parts of the movie, we will see that he uh, has uh, lost control. He has his arms, his arms, but they he's not in full control of his arms. It's a real thing, by the way. It's a real thing. Um, and But uh, Strangelove uh, does involuntarily heil uh, a salute, and we know he's a former Nazi with his involuntary uh, hiling, and he's, his arm, his phantom arm, starts, starts choking him at, at, at one point. It's, it's very funny stuff. Peter Sellers is just amazing uh, in the film. He also, uh, he also plays uh, the president fairly straight. Uh, the, everybody around the president is pretty weird and pretty crazy, and so... Uh, uh, when he is playing President uh, Merkin Muffley, he uh, is doing it 
not very, there's not very much uh, uh, comedy in his performance. The comedy is all around him. Uh, and then uh, Colonel Mandrake, who is the assistant to the crazy general that starts the whole thing off. Uh, this is some of Kubrick's um, uh, cameras and things like that that he used in some of his films. And uh, they had a display at the uh, museum, the county museum, and I went to see it and took some photos of some of this stuff. So I uh, thought it might be kind of fun to check it out. There's uh, these amazing lenses, the candlelight lens, shooting literally in candlelight in Barry Lyndon. And here is the survival kit from Dr. Strangelove. And I believe I have the scene where he reads off the survival kit contents. And uh, it's uh, really quite fun. Uh, so the, in the, the scenes that I have marked out is one of the very first scenes in the movie with the general's secretary. And when you watch that, uh, I want you to uh, notice a couple of things. First off, it is all done in one take. It's not a real difficult take, but it's all done in one take. There's no editing or anything like that. And the scene opens up, and the secretary is in a bikini, and she's under a sun lamp in a hotel room, and she takes a call for the general, who is in the bathroom, and uh, she's talking to another general, and it appears she knows the other general... Uh, at least by his first name. She starts calling him Freddy, so perhaps she knows him uh, on, a, on a more friendly sort of a basis, let's say, as well. And uh, she does a pretty good job. Notice how good of a job she does sort of um, smoothing out her general's rough and gruff demeanor. Uh, she's going to say he's in the powder room, and the general requests that I take your message. In the meantime, he's sort of barking and uh, um, being very gruff and so on off camera. But as a good secretary, she's being very diplomatic about the whole thing. And she uh, tells him, the general's in the powder room. Can you tell me what it's all about? And uh, Freddie, okay, does. He tells her, yeah, there's, a, there's an attack. Uh, and uh, wing attack plan R and the whole bit. And he has no problems uh, telling the secretary all this. So that's, uh, that's really kind of funny. Um, Miss Scott is her name. And earlier in the film, when we're up in the B-52 bomber, one of the crew members has a girly magazine, and he opens up the centerfold, and there is Miss Scott. And then later on in the movie, we see Miss Scott. So um, some little, some little uh, Easter eggs sort of floating through the movie. Uh, then, later on, we, uh, we have another scene. I'm going to describe some of the scenes. Normally, I'd be talking through these clips as we watch them, uh, and I'm going to do that right now. So, uh, we have the, the crazy general who decided he wanted to set his bomber squadron off uh, on Wing of Plankton. Plan R. He wants to start the war. He thinks if we have uh, the drop on the Russians or the Ruskies, as he calls them, or the commies, he's using all sorts of derogatory terms. Uh, and he talks about water quite a bit and uh, fluoridation. And he believes that fluoride in the water, and we know it uh, to be a deterrent to cavities, but he believes fluoride in the water is a communist plot. Okay, so he's very paranoid, and that's a big reason why he decides to start this all off. So uh, there's that, and we still have paranoid people today and fake news and all that kind of stuff. So uh, the movie is really making fun of that sort of thing. The next scene, Hello, Dimitri, uh, is the president talking to the Russian premier, or president, I guess, and... It's a very funny phone call. It sounds like a parent talking to a child at first. He's going to say, 
Uh, now Dimitri, one of our generals, went and did a silly thing. He went a little funny in the head. Okay, now uh, that's the way we talk to children. Okay, what's going on with, uh, you know, with the war, or with the 9-11, the, uh, or something like that. And uh, so he's sort of talking to the premier almost like a child. He went and did a silly thing. He went a little funny in the head. Uh, and then it's going to sound like a lover's quarrel. Uh, I can be just as sorry as you can. I can be even more sorry. And it almost sounds like they're having a, a spat on the, on the phone. So that's Hello, Dimitri. Uh, then we get the survival kit contents and our pilot of the B-52 bomber, played by Slim Pickens. What a wonderful name. He often played uh, westerns and cowboy roles and that sort of thing. Kubrick told him it was a drama. Not, there's no comedy. Told, it to, told him to play it like a drama. And so he's going to read the survival kit contents, which are, they start off fairly serious uh, with, um, uh, with a, 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 a pistol and uh, possible uh, painkillers and things like that. Uh, and then it gets into the sort of thing that a soldier might use um, uh, possibly during wartime. Some of our soldiers in World War II in Germany could maybe trade chocolates or cigarettes or nylons or something like that, uh, maybe possibly to young women, maybe in trade for sex, something like that. So this very unusual surv survival kit contents uh, is uh, funnier and funnier the longer he reads the, uh, the list. And at the very end, he's going to say, shoot, a feller could have a pretty good time in Dallas with all this stuff. And if you look very closely, you'll see that his lips are a little bit off. And that's because President Kennedy had been assassinated in, oh, in Dallas, I'm sorry, he says a feller could have a pretty good time in Vegas with all that stuff. He says a feller could have a pretty good weekend in Vegas with all that stuff. Well, uh, originally he says a feller could have a pretty good time in Dallas. Dallas is where President Kennedy was assassinated, so they went back in and, and looped over the dialogue, changing Dallas to Vegas. So uh, they did a pretty good job. You probably wouldn't notice it if I hadn't told you about it. Uh, then... Uh, we get a bomb run, uh, which is um, which is a lot of fun. Check that one out. Uh, and our it's a very classic scene. It's a classic scene. Slim Pickens. Uh, I don't want to give it away. You'll see it. And when you see it, uh, it is instantly recognizable. It has been parodied uh, dozens of times from Homer Simpson on. And uh, when we see the bomb run. Uh, the, the pilot of the plane, they have a near miss. The, the, the Russians are trying to shoot them down. The president has warned the Russians that our planes are coming through, which horrifies one of the generals. Uh, but he says we can't, we can't start nuclear war. So uh, they survive a near miss. They lose a lot of their electronics. And some of the electronics they lose have to do with the, the bomb bay doors that won't open. So our, our pilot, uh, Colonel Kong, uh, goes in to try to fix the electronics. He's sitting on top of one of the bombs, and when he finally fixes the electronics, the doors open. So that's classic scene. Then we're going to get Dr. Strangelove talking about, uh, in the event of the nuclear war, perhaps we can preserve the essence of our government and society by digging into the, a, a mountain. Uh, he talks about mine shafts and um, that they could uh, uh, build uh, living space for thousands of people. And the odd thing about all this is that we actually have that uh, in a mountain in West Virginia. There is a half hollowed out mountain, and if there is a very bad war, then the president and members of Congress and the cabinet have a place to go, uh, living quarters, hospital, markets, all that 
kind of stuff. So as far out and strange as it sounds, with Strange Love talking about preserving uh, the best parts of society, uh, it actually has happened. And of course, he gets the general's interest by saying that we need to repopulate the country so there would possibly be three or four women for every man so that uh, with, the, with the birth rate and so on, we could help repopulate the country. So <laughs> I don't think that's part of the plan today, uh, but uh, General Turgidson is uh, very interested in that part of Strange Love's idea. Um, and, uh, and then the, at the very end, Dr. Strange Love and his uh, phantom arm uh, with, uh, with the hyaline and, also, and choking himself and all that. It's very fun stuff. It's a great movie to watch. Uh, I have a lot of the clips. What you might do is watch some of the clips and see where they lead you. Go down the rabbit hole, see where they lead you, and, and watch some of that stuff on your own. I think, uh, I think it's a lot of fun. So next up, Kubrick's masterpiece, 2001, A Space Odyssey. That's the full title from 1968. He started on it in 1964, right after Dr. Strangelove came out. And he thought it would be out by 65 or 66, 67 at the latest, but it didn't come out until 1968. And it, uh, it really is an, uh, an amazing film. This is all pre-CGI. Uh, it's all models, right? There's nothing done in computers or anything like that, but you wouldn't even notice it. It has aged so well. It is just astounding how good the movie looks. They took a lot of care to uh, get uh, the latest uh, scientific uh, knowledge and, and technology and so on uh, from... Uh, to get the latest uh, knowledge and technology and so on from the uh, experts at the time, and uh, we even see a, a uh, kind of an inspiration for George Lucas. We see the, the not-quite-finished uh, space wheel. This is the space station, and it is going to be spinning round and round, creating an artificial gravity. Uh, we know that when uh, men and women are in space for long periods of time, uh, they lose muscle mass and bone mass, and uh, it is a real uh, hardship. All that, all that weightlessness, you wouldn't think, but it's a real hardship on, on people that spend that much time in space. And you can create, with centrifugal force, a kind of artificial gravity. I keep wondering why we haven't done something like that yet today, but apparently, uh, I don't know, maybe it's too expensive, I'm not sure what, but... Uh, Seems like a pretty good idea. So some of the sets, you'll see them sort of curving off into the distance. And so there's this big, giant space wheel somewhere between the Earth and the Moon. And then once the uh, ship is full of astronauts ready to head to Jupiter, where the alien signal is emanating from, there's a sort of a smaller version of that. Uh, and we see an amazing uh, jogging sequence of the uh, astronaut. It looks like he's, he's jogging sort of up the wall and across the ceiling and back down again. That, that's not the one, but it kind of gives you that feeling since, since it's much smaller. You can see the whole thing all in one shot. So, yes, lots of scientific accuracy. And uh, the movie starts out with pre-humans, um, ha sort of halfway between uh, uh, apes and humans, and they are visited. We don't see them, we never see the aliens, but we see a black monolith with the particular dimensions, 1, 4, 9, right? The square root of 1 is 1, the square root of 2 is 4, the square root of 3 is 9, and anyway, the aliens have left it there. They are hoping to help whoever these creatures are going to be push their evolution along a little further and a little faster. So uh, the, 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 the uh, 
anthropods, I guess, I'm not sure what else, that's sort of the ape men, uh, are going to be inspired to use tools, uh, presumably also fire, but with tools, uh, being able to eat meat, all that protein is good for the brain, and along with fire, uh, then we can have much faster um, cognitive abilities, brain development, and all that sort of thing. And then there is one of the two most famous edits in film history, along with the edit from Lawrence of Arabia, with the match and the desert, and this one, uh, one of the apes uh, with the bone as a weapon has beaten off the, uh, beaten back the, the challenge of another tribe, and uh, so we have the first weapon, okay, so it's, it's sort of good for hunting, but it's also kind of a weapon as well, right, next, what's, what's next, okay, uh, uh, rocks, bow and arrow, uh, and, uh, you know, on through, right, the beginning of uh, the beginning of tools, that's for sure, but also the beginning of weapons. Anyway, the ape is going to, uh, in, in uh, victory, he's going to howl and throw the bone up in the air, and Kubrick is going to cut five million years into the future, and a match cut of an orbiting satellite. So a very famous edit. I believe I have that in the list of uh, scenes that you can see. I found that online as well. And there's a wonderful scene called the Blue Danube. Uh, and when Kubrick was editing the movie in his private editing studio, he would just play music while he was editing. And he uh, thought it looked pretty nice. He was going to have an original score, but he liked uh, some of the classical music. So he ended up using the Blue Danube. And that's the name of that scene as uh, this ship is going to have to start rotating to match the the rotation of the space wheel, and it's going to match up, and then uh, one of our scientists is going to get on board, and they're going to take him to the moon, where they have found a black monolith. And for us viewers, it's the second one, but uh, as far as they know, it is the first evidence of life off Earth. Okay, some kind of intelligent life off Earth. We know we didn't put it there. Somebody must have put it there, and so it's quite exciting, but they uh, try to keep it secret. And once it's been uncovered, it's been placed a few meters below the surface of the Earth, and once the sunlight hits it, it is sort of uh, like a, um, uh, it's sort of like a, uh, uh, a warning system uh, that once the, the, those, those apes on Earth have made it to the moon, then they have the technology at their disposal to take the next step. And uh, it's sort of a sentinel. It's, the story is called The Sentinel that, uh, that it's based on from Arthur C. Clarke. So the sun hits it. It sends out a loud noise signal, and it uh, is aimed toward Jupiter. So they put together a spacecraft and two astronauts piloting it, and I believe four others in a kind of hibernation. Four others in a kind of hibernation. Uh, so you'll see all that. I've got the jogging, seeing him jogging up the space wheel and down and around and so on. And uh, the computer is named HAL. And uh, here's a bit of a look at the set. There he is. Uh, so. Here he is jogging. He's on the inside of this big giant thing. It was, I don't know, five stories high. The whole thing had to rotate. It was an amazing set. Uh, and if you're, uh, when you go online, you will see um, film of it rotating. And sometimes uh, the actor would have to start the camera because no one else could be in it. The, 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 the scene would shoot the entire interior of this uh, space wheel and so nobody could be there not even a camera operator um, there's a part where the floor sort of opens up and the camera passes through and then the floor closes back down again uh, so there, I've got a pretty good making of documentary in there it's a little longer you don't have to watch it. it's like maybe 40 minutes but it's a pretty good documentary there's a lot of stuff on 2001 
online. Um, and you can watch as little or as much of the extra stuff. Please watch, uh, you know, the Bone and the Blue Danube and the, the Pan Am spaceship. There's a, there's a uh, uh, stewardess uh, sort of walking with grip-soled shoes, jogging on the space wheel, and so on. So watch the parts, the main parts I've got, but then there's a, a bunch of pretty good documentaries. I found one that I kind of like, hosted by James Cameron, that I think you might like. But it's 40 minutes long, and you don't have to watch all of that. So, the crux of the movie is that Hal, the computer, makes a mistake. And computers don't make mistakes. They're programmed to, to zeros and ones and all that. They're not supposed to make mistakes. They think that Hal has made a mistake. They think that, that maybe they need to uh, disconnect him, at least the higher functions. He can still keep heating the spaceship and whatever and providing the oxygen, but they want to they want to unhook Hal, and Hal catches wind of it and uh, goes uh, homicidal. And he turns off all of the uh, life functions on the hibernating astronauts. I, I don't know if it's in there somewhere, the hibernating astronauts. And one of the other two... Uh, is uh, outside of the spaceship and he gets his air cut off and so the last astronaut Dave uh, is outside of the capsule he went out to retrieve his friend the other astronaut and he went out so fast that he didn't take his helmet with him so um, he has to use his ingenuity to get back inside the uh, the ship, which he does, and unhook the higher brain functions of Hal. It's a very disturbing scene um, with the computer. He says, help me, please stop, please stop. Uh, I'm dying, I'm dying, and so on. Uh, and it's a computer, so it's very interesting uh, to see. And of course, Hal has killed uh, five humans, so uh, maybe he should be shut down. Um, fantastic scene, fantastic scene. Then, uh, Dave gets close to Jupiter, and there is a last monolith floating in space around one of the moons of Jupiter, and he gets in his little pod and goes towards that and goes through what we assume is some sort of a stargate, and that is the very trippy sequence of the movie. So young people of that era started showing up. It was made kind of for families and so on, and adults is sort of a thinking person's sci-fi, very hard science and all that, but the, the theater owners and the studio started noticing more and more young people uh, some of them likely tripping on acid would be the term LSD, take an LSD trip. And so they went with it. They went with it and the, the advertising the ultimate trip. And that's the actual poster from the film. So it's really astounding that they would do something like that and call the movie the ultimate trip. And... Um, so he, uh, you know, after, after uh, Hal, I'm afraid, he goes uh, through the section called Beyond the Infinite. And then we see the scene of him in a very nice hotel room. And we assume that the aliens want to make the human feel comfortable and not nervous or anything like that. So they construct something from... I imagine human memory or his mind or something. They maybe probe his mind and construct something to make him feel kind of at home and nice and all that. And uh, uh, and then we have the Star Child. So it's a a really fantastic film. Uh, I can't speak highly enough from it. It's uh, you know it had its 50th anniversary uh, a couple years ago. Uh, Christopher Nolan loved it so much he helped in the restoration of it. And uh, 
uh, and uh, sort of presented it. Uh, every director, you know, of, of anything, not just sci-fi like George Lucas, but uh, or Steven Spielberg, but even Martin Scorsese, uh, is a, a highly revered film. And over the years, uh, it has gone up in estimation from uh, from this bizarre film that nobody could quite figure out what it was all about. And the ending is very open. It's a very open ending. Um, it's not for everyone. Um, if you saw Christopher Nolan's um, Interstellar, then uh, if you liked it, then you would kind of like this movie, I think. Right? I think you would uh, like this movie. Um, but if you didn't like uh, Christopher Nolan's Interstellar, then uh, you might stay away from it. And uh, like I said, Christopher Nolan, clearly he he loves this movie and wanted to uh, present it. A couple years ago, it played at the Cinerama Dome up in Hollywood. Okay, so I think I said Clockwork Orange, but I see in my notes that Clockwork Orange will be coming up later once we get into the 70s. So that's fine. We've gone long enough. Uh, like I said, um, I've only got like, you know... Um, Cleopatra, and Breathless, and then the rest is on Kubrick for this class. So I show big chunks of both of these movies, and I have lots of clips lined up for you. So please, please uh, spend some time and go through clips and go down the rabbit hole and find other clips and other documentaries and other things on there. Uh, you're right there on YouTube. And so you can stop my discussion every once in a while and go over and look at some clips and things like that and then go back to the discussion and so on and um, uh, really get in, enjoy, appreciate the movie um, and uh, enjoy the ultimate trip. And uh, like I said, Clockwork Orange and Full Metal Jacket will be coming up a little later in the semester. Okay, the slide you've been waiting for. Yeah, there you go. It means we're at the end. <laughs> so um, I hope you're enjoying class presented this way. Uh, it's as close as I can get to the actual classroom experience. Uh, you get to pace yourself. I, I'm sitting here doing this straight on through in one take, uh, talking straight for about an hour or so, which is why there might be little bits of uh, fumbling around and so on. But uh, uh, you, of course, are uh, get get to watch for a little while, hit pause, go get a sandwich, whatever you need to do, go watch some clips from the movie. Uh, the class would be three hours long. So, you know, not that you have to spend three hours on it, but uh, spend a little bit of time. Uh, the lecture is probably close to an hour and spend a little bit of time going through um, all these clips from Dr. Strangelove in 2001 and, uh, and Breathless and Cleopatra too. Um, and, uh, you know, spread it out. Don't, don't rush through. And uh, I think you'll enjoy, enjoy yourself. And you'll, you'll learn a lot more. And you might want to watch one of these movies for your paper. I will uh, have more information on, on papers and Canvas and all that sort of stuff uh, later on. But for now, thank you. Good night and good luck. And... I will be back with 104 class number 6 at the appropriate time.